Funding for this program has been provided by the annual financial support of viewers like you and by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Remember Excite? By March 1997, after three years, they'd gone from hacking code in a garage to become an internet media company. Revenues from advertising were into the millions, and they'd outgrown office number three. Time for another move. Three years ago, we visited with six kids in a garage working on their dreams. Starting with $18,000 and a bag of brown rice, they built Excite into a company with 200 workers worth a quarter of a billion dollars. And this is just the start. It has to be, because in the world of internet business, the rule is grow or die. You see, we moved from the garage to the dining room. Uh -huh. We moved from the dining room to an office about 5,000 square feet. We moved from that office to this office about 12,000 square feet. And now we're moving to our final resting place. I wouldn't have even guessed that we would have moved into the Garcia office that, that, we, that we were at. There, you know, 2,000 square foot office with little dingy cubes. So step up for us and then to move in here and then to move into our very own building. It's just a surprise. Excite is visible proof of the Internet's astonishing progress. Its growth mirrors the expansion of the wired world. In four years, the number of Americans using the Internet has risen from 5 million to 62 million. Traffic on the Internet is doubling every 100 days. And the fun's only just begun. We're only two years into this huge revolution called the commercial use of the Internet. We're only two years in. Think where other industries were just two years into their lives. Think where cars were two years into automobiles. Oh, well, they were terrible. I mean, bicycle wheels, a tiller for the steering wheel, a motor that took you at five miles an hour and died in about a half a mile. If you look back in history, past the scope of this program, past 1970, past 1900, back to when we were human beings in small tribes hunting and gathering, Everybody you had to deal with was somebody you saw every day. And we're a species that's based on communication with our entire tribe. And one thing that modern communication does is make it possible, again, for us to communicate with anybody in the world. Unlike the PC, it levers the top line. It helps us entertain and inform and educate and inspire and sell and make community, uh, even make meaning out of life and out of death. And, and, and that's a far more powerful dynamic than uh, cranking out memos and doing financial analyses with a spreadsheet. Think of this as uh, just a few milliseconds after the Big Bang. I mean, we only barely discern the fundamental laws of physics, the business models that are going to work. What better place for a Big Bang than CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Research? Believe it or not, this is where the explosive growth of the Internet began. Here in Geneva, Switzerland, the next great internet breakthrough, the World Wide Web, was created by an English programmer named Tim Berners-Lee. There was always different sorts of people from different countries who brought different sorts of computing equipment. And so CERN was at the forefront of making gateways for file transfer exchange so that you could get files from different sorts of computer, email exchange so that you could get email from the proprietary systems to cross borders and go into uh, another proprietary system. And although I wasn't involved with that, that was the spirit. There was a lot of networking. 
Despite all this networking, there was no simple way for CERN scientists to retrieve information from each other's computers. In fact, it was exactly like the Internet on a small scale. <laughs> I'll be at this forever. What I'm trying to draw here is 160,000 computers in 800 different networks, all running different operating systems, different programming languages. It's a mess. And that was the situation faced by Tim Berners-Lee. He wanted to find a way to get information from this computer over here to this user over here. And the question was, how to get it? In fact, it was basically technically trivial to go and get it. It just happened that you had to be a guru of the highest degree to actually be able to navigate all the networks and figure out all the programs that you would come across on your way and, uh, and know, the, uh, you know uh, what commands to give them to actually get the data back. And the chances are when you got it back, you wouldn't be able to actually uh, read it anyway because of all the incompatibilities. I started in October writing a, a program called, which I called World Wide Web. You're reading something, you could, if it's interesting and you've got right access to it, you could just highlight a phrase, hit a hotkey, control, shift, N, and it would bring up a, another window. Tim Berners-Lee's greatest achievement may have been giving an address to every bit of information on the Internet. You've seen these things. www.cringely.com. That's my web page, and this is the address called a Universal Resource Locator. Forget about that. The important thing is that you don't have to know about names of files. You don't have to know where this is. You just have to remember cringely.com, and you're there. By inventing HTTP, or Hypertext Transfer Protocol, Tim figured out how to embed an address under any word or picture you like. And then when you click on that word or icon, you automatically jump through the internet to, say, the Cringely domain. Ah, there's a website for sore eyes. The power of a hypertext link is that it can link to absolutely anything. That's the fundamental concept. The fundamental idea was anything which was out there somewhere sitting on a computer disk where that computer was attached to a network, you ought to be able to give it an address. You ought to be able to make a link to it. The uh, key insight that I think I credit Tim Berners-Lee with is the URL, the idea that there's a uniform r resource locator that says I can point at any particular bit of information on the Internet. If I mean that you should go to this, this university, look in their FTP archive, look in their file archives, and download this picture of a Corvette and put it up on the screen, I now have a way of doing that. So that's why the characters HTTP backslash www have become as familiar as Coca-Cola. In fact, Tim's idea wasn't new. Twenty years earlier, computer visionary Ted Nelson, author of the seminal hacker work Computer Lib, had proposed a global network. He called it Xanadu, a magic place of literary memory, after Coleridge's poem Kubla Khan. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sacred sea. Xanadu was measureless too. It involved storing all the world's literature on databases and accessing it through links which Ted called hypertext, with an automatic system for paying royalties to authors whose work was used. But like Coleridge's vision, Nelson Xanadu never saw the light of day. But Tim's invention did, and the World Wide Web turned a network for geeks into something everyone could use, though not everyone's pleased. Tim Berners-Lee uh, figured out that the key was extreme simplicity. And that's um, very painful to me because, of course, now the Websters are trying to grapple with all the issues we were trying to solve in a single design at the beginning. And the World Wide Web uh, is pretty awful. I mean, I, I, I dearly love Tim Berners-Lee, and I think he's a great guy and a wonderful idealist, and has, he just achieves wonderful things. But the, uh, the unfortunate thing about the World Wide Web is just how, how messed up it is. Perhaps it's sour grapes, but at least Ted Nelson can claim the creation of hypertext. But does he? Hypertext is obvious. <laughs> so I do not claim to have invented hypertext, I merely discovered it. 